Okay, those of you that are here, I just want to honor my bride, um, who, without whom, uh, no trains run on time. And, uh, and uh, it, 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 is, it is a fearsome thing to be well-loved. It's extraordinary to be well-loved. And all good revelation grows in ground that's well-loved. Amen? Thank you, baby. <laughs> so, those of you that have your paper Bibles, anybody have a paper Bible? Hold it up. Come on. Yes. Okay, digital Bible people too. It's cool. It's cool. It's, it's cool. We, we, we coming forward. I'm down. And you know, if you're like me, that means you have to carry like a backpack of about 15 Bibles to get all the translations that you want to look at, you know, by the time you're done, you know. And, and so uh, at any rate, um, those of you, I, I will give you right now a head start because it's a, we're going to be in a book today that is not often, you know, traveled. So you, you, you can begin to look in the, in the concordance or the... Or the, the the, the directions at the beginning to find uh, Hosea, because we're going to be in the book of Hosea today. And so I should give you just a wee bit of the background of, of this morning. So about, I th I'm thinking it was eight or ten weeks ago. I don't know. It was whenever Chris decided to go on vacation. Um, <laughs> when he bought the tickets, you know. And, and uh, so he messaged me, and I, I forget where I was at the time. He's like, hey, can you preach on this day? And I'm like, Heck yeah, he's learned to give me plenty of notice because I travel a lot, you know, so he gives me plenty of notice and, and he says, can you preach there? And I, so I message him back. I'm like, do you have anything you want me to preach on? It's always important to do that. Don't, you know, he, he is, he's accountable for this house yes. to the Lord. So, you know, the honor for that responsibility is a big deal. So I said, you know, is there anything you want me to preach on? I don't know what he's got going on, you know, you know, something like judgment, hell fire, something like that. <laughs> Who knows? You know, you know me. That's what I like. Okay. So he goes, no, I don't. What do you, what do you want to preach on? So I said, I said, well, I'm going to preach on the authority of the believer. And as soon as those words left my, my mouth via my thumbs, I heard the Lord say to me, Something that, that some, I've actually heard this sentence from him more, more times than I care to admit. Being a little, a wee bit headlong, me and the Apostle Peter were chopping the ears off of people all the time. I just, I may be that guy, you know? And so uh, as soon as I hear the Lord say, he goes, are you sure? Now, when the Lord talks to you like that, now I don't know how, how you guys have conversation with the Lord, but my conversations with the Lord are pretty just, you know, kind of sort of raw and conversational like I would talk to you. Um, you know, he's, he's my best friend. He's also king of the universe. And there's just the, no, the fear of the Lord and the awe of God, but we can have pretty good conversations. It's pretty amazing. So he says, are you sure? And so I immediately texted Chris and said, but we'll see. And so about two weeks ago, I was sitting um, in the back of our house uh, on, on the back patio having a conversation with Jesus about a cigar. And, um, and, uh, and so the, and, and the Lord drops into my heart and he says, wilderness. And he says, in fact, and this thing just, I just started, you know, I don't even know what to say, what this looks like, but I see words from the Lord when they come. So I see the word wilderness and it's, and it's like, my wife will like this. It's like glittery and it's got little light things going on. My wife is the glitter queen. She loves glittery things. And so I see this like, you know, word from the Lord says wilderness. And then he says, treasure stored in wilderness places. Now, any of you have any wilderness experiences in your life ever? Anybody, raise, raise your hand if you've experienced any sort of wilderness experience in your life whatsoever. 
you know, over the over the course of life. Those of you who have not raised your hands are, um, you know, like Dr. Phil level of of dishonest. Uh, you know, like like your 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 Mari Povich stuff. It's just that's this not going to be good. Um, so every one of us have wilderness seasons, right? And the interesting thing is, is if you look in the Old Testament. Um, at wilderness, and you see how often it's men mentioned and how many things happen in the wilderness, next to the wilderness, going through the wilderness, coming from the wilderness, on the way to the wilderness. All of these things that happen in the, in, in the Old Testament, it's strange how often the word wilderness comes up in that place. And it's, sometimes it's referred to as a place. Sometimes it is referred to as a sort of place, right? An actual physical place or a sort of of place. And so in, in, in the midst of this wilderness thing that's out there, we recognize that God, if you, you spend any time looking at this and look in the context of it, you begin to discover pretty quickly that God has a passion for wilderness places. He has a passion. He's passionate about it. It's not just like something, many of us look at, at wilderness like it's a, it, it, it's, it's a bummer. And yet God seems to have this passion for wilderness places. The only problem is we don't really get that. Most of us are looking for a way out of the wilderness. Right? We're, 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 we're like Las Vegas, we're digging wells in the desert. We're trying to get a whole bunch of water. We're planting trees. We're planting flowers. We're trying to make it look like a garden. It's a desert. It's a wilderness, right? And we're, we're trying to get out of that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as it goes. But if we're going to understand God's passion for, and I actually uncharacteristically made a couple of notes here just so that we could actually finish today. Um, normally, I would have preached this to take about three hours, but I think I can do it in two. <laughs> so, if we're really going to understand God's passion for wilderness, we cannot do so unless we first understand his passion for romance. If you do not understand that the original romantic was God, those of you gentlemen who, who think that you're sometime you're going to die and be delivered from the necessity to be romantic, I hate to be disappointing to you, <laughs> but it's not happening. You're, you're, you're going to need romance. There's going to be romance in your life forever now because the father of romance is God. The reason that we have chick flicks today <laughs> is God. He's the author of romance. He's the original lover. He is the original lover. Everything. You look, at, you look at the lush language in the Old Testament where he talks about love and talks about these sorts of things. We're going to get into Hosea here in a minute and begin to talk about some romantic things. But if you begin to unpack those things, if you do not understand that romance and that heart for romance from God at that point, you will not have any sort of context to hang wilderness in. You can't understand the fact that God is not just trying to rescue you from wilderness, but he has a passion for what happens with you in the wilderness, and he will call you there to give you things he can give you nowhere else. And if you spend your time, by the way, I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone else in this place because I try to escape too. We're like greased pigs. God's like, okay, I just need you to sit right here for a sec. We're like, <laughs> we're all over the place, you know. We're just trying to squirt out the side. Oh, I got, you know, I got an open feet. You're like a broken field runner, you know. You're like, I can make the move. Thank goodness no one who did the Heisman Trophy ever made that move that I just did. I don't even know what they'd call it. No, 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 no. So 
We're going to go to Hosea, but if we're going to go to Hosea, we're going to have to understand some things about prophets. Now, there's two things in the, in the word where we see the word prophet. Or we have, so we have something that's prophetic, right, or prophetic words. That's one thing. Totally different than a prophet, right? A person who is in the office of a prophet. Now, Old Testament, we don't often see this. Dr. Tony and I were talking about this earlier, but you would be really glad about this. That, that we don't often see this sort of manifestation of Old Testament prophets like we did in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, if you were a prophet, you weren't just a prophet to speak the word of the Lord, you got to demonstrate. Your entire life was the word of God, right? It was a big deal. Not only that, but culturally, everybody knew that you were the dude. Hosea was actually a prophet. If you read the beginning of Hosea chapter one, that he actually was a prophet during four different kingdoms, one king, the next king, the next king, the next king, four kingdoms, everybody recognizes that Hosea is a prophet. When Jeremiah was there, everybody knew Jeremiah was a prophet. Everybody knew that Isaiah was a prophet. Their whole lives were actually dramatizations of the word of the Lord. So when the word came, it had the context of already having acted out the stuff that God was doing. And what God wanted to say. So there's this, God is a master communicator. He loves having some mystery and some things that you've got to dig and find. But in the midst of that thing, he will make it thick. It's not one dimensional. It's, it's, it's deep. It's thick. He's using drama. He will use circumstance and everything to give the word that he releases context so that you know what to do with it. It doesn't, he, he, he's not looking, it's not a whack-a-mole game in God, right? You know, he doesn't go like, whoop, here's the thing, whack. It's not like, whoops, missed. No, you're going to know, here's the timing. It's, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. I mean, if you know your kings and priests, I know, uncomfortable. Some of you need to change the dress code. I'm just saying, I'm kidding. He says, wearing tie-dye to preach in. If you have not got a tie-dye from Malachi, these come with a prophetic word, by the way, from that little man who loves God. So let's just unpack what this looks like for just a second. Let's talk about Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13, this is just an example, right? Jeremiah prophet of the Lord. Now, he did all sorts of crazy stuff in his life, but I just want to illustrate something about what I just said, that their whole life is a dramatization. Let's imagine that you wake up this morning like Jeremiah did in Jeremiah chapter 13. Verse 2, you hear these words from the Lord. I want you. By the way, it's the first words you hear in the morning. Your eyes open. You stretch beautifully. Because like the movies... I want you to go to Target and buy new underwear. You will never wash them. Now, some of you, that, that just blows right past you. I am a clean freak. Now, there, not, that doesn't mean that every area of my life is perfectly organized or clean. It just means that there's at least one shower, probably two every day. And here's the thing, I do the laundry at the house, unless my wife needs something that she needs for the thing. I do the laundry, in fact, I, she hates this. I go around and gather up all her stuff around the house that she doesn't even want to go in the laundry. And then when she comes, <laughs> when, when she finds it, she'd be like, I just took this off and put it down for a second. Where'd it go? And I'm like, it's in the washing machine. I just grabbed it. You know, I was trying to make all of a colors load, right? Because I had one thing that was dirty and it needed to be clean. See, my problem is if it touches your body, it is defiled. And it now needs to be clean. So there are some things that I've settled in my heart. Number one, we don't care about the water bill. And number two, so, because the plants need to grow and because we have to do laundry and because we use the dishwasher if there are two glasses and a fork. Okay, so that's just, I'm just, yeah, she doesn't. 
She does, I'm just, this is my own, this is my moment. This, uh, this is me just unburdening myself. And so, and so I am horrified by this scripture. I'm horrified. Jeremiah goes, he gets some new underpants. The Lord says, look, you're never going to wash these bad boys. We find out in verse 3, the Lord says, put them on. I'll tell you when to take them off. That is heinous. That's heinous. Now, we don't know how much time goes by between 2 and 4, verse 2 and verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 13. But what we do know is that eventually God says to him, Kate, I want you to take the underwear off. They're soiled. <laughs> All right. So he has, he has these brand new underpants, expensive linen waist, waistband, it says. Very nice. The Bible's so circumspect. So... This linen waistband, he takes these bad boys off and the Lord says, look, don't not, do not put those in the laundry. I want you to go down next to the river Euphrates. I want you to bury them under a rock. <laughs> look, here's the prophet, right? Now, li listen, ladies and gentlemen, understand the cultural thing. Everybody is watching. Because it's like the movies. What is the prophet doing? There, this is the story is afterwards, because everybody's watching this. They're like, Jeremiah got some new underpants. He never washed them. He wore them for, well, I don't know, a long time. They're nasty. And then he went and buried, they followed him down to the river, waving his underpants around. And he's burying them under a rock. They're like, what the heck? And all of them are having the expectation. They're like, oh, God's going to speak about this. Right? The, the Lord designs this thing. This is, a, this is an example from God, right? So Jeremiah, however long it is, he keeps them buried there. The Lord eventually says, go get them. And it says, strangely enough, it says they were ruined. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're right. Because they're staying buried forever. I'm not touching that. It's a bit of a stick, whatever. I'm not. So he goes, he gets the underwear out of the thing, and the Lord has him take them and wave them around. Then the Lord talks about how all of their deeds are like that pair of underpants. So here you have this prophet who demonstrates with their life the drama of their life with underpants. I don't know what you'd call that. That play. But he demonstrates it, and then the Lord releases this word out of that place. And you think that's an isolated incident. Read some of the other crazy stuff that happens to Jeremiah in his life. That's just one of them. Here's one, Isaiah. Isaiah is a prince of the court of Israel. He's, he's literal royalty, okay? He's hanging out every day around the king. He is a prince of the court of Israel. He is also the prophet, maybe the most momentous prophet of the time. All right? And so we find out in Isaiah chapter 20, once again in verse 2, the Lord speaks to Isaiah. Isaiah wakes up. This is, these first morning words from God are like, you'd start to get a complex. This is what God says to him. Isaiah, I want you to strip naked, take your shoes off, and walk around like that. Do you, you notice what's missing there? It's like, like, for how long? <laughs> like, like, is this like just in the living room? With the shades drawn? So, right? So, the strange thing is, when we find out in verse 3, the horror. Because it says, The Lord's talking about Isaiah, and he says, so now between verse 2 and verse 3, God says, Isaiah has walked around bare naked in bare feet for three years. Three years in the court of the Lord. Now, once again, all of Israel's watching. You could just see the tabloids, right? Day 600, Isaiah naked. You know, will he put on pants? You know, <laughs> honey, have you found my pants? 
You know, here's the whole thing. I mean, think about how this goes. You walk in, you have a little meeting with the Department of Defense, whatever it is, and you're like, hey, uh, whoa, Isaiah. Whoa, okay. What's up, bro? It's all good. Hey, hey, it's good, guys. Hey, 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 my eyes are up here. My eyes. You know, can you imagine how that goes? Three years he's naked. And then the Lord releases a word and says, okay, this is about Egypt. And it says, you're going to get carried away in captivity and you're going to be naked with your butt exposed and you're barefoot when they lead you away. And it's because of this and this and this and this. So here you have this dynamic demonstration of the thing. And Tony's like, yes, Jesus, the, the office of the prophet has just, there's a new covenant. <laughs> we're, new, we're in the new covenant office of a prophet now, Right? Right? So here we are. Now come out of that context, guys. Come out of that context to Hosea. Chapter 1 and 2. God says to Hosea, um, 1 and 2 verse, through verse 13, God says to Hosea, he says, listen, I want you to go get yourself a wife. And by the way, I want you to pick one that you're absolutely certain is going to cheat on you and leave you as a single dad with two kids. And by the way, we're going to get you to name your children things that no parent should name their children, ever. Horrible things. And you're going to be publicly excoriated. All of Israel is going to be watching you because you are the prophet. <laughs> so they're all going to be watching this. It's not going to be like, I had a private pain, you know, in, in a relationship that was tough and whatever it was. No, 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 no. This is tabloids. You're out there. Everybody's watching. What's going on? Yep, sure enough. Here he is. He, now he's a single dad. The whole thing goes on. And that's chapter 1. And chapter 1, all the way through verse 13 of chapter 2 of Hosea, you find out that God, it's this laying out of all of the things. This is where you begin to see the romantic heart of God come to bear. And it's not just all the ways that Israel's done it. It's all the ways that God's heart's broken. All the places where he did everything. He sowed every seed he could. He wrapped, he loved her. He chased her. He did all this stuff. And Israel has been unfaithful to him over and over and over and over and done the wrong thing anyway, even though they were well-loved. How many of you know that being well-loved doesn't mean that you do everything automatically produce every result you want. What's stunning to me is, <clears throat> as we go into verse 14, after they finish their, in, uh, in uh, Hosea chapter 2, and we see this whole dramatization of him begin to unfold. And it's, by the way, it's not, I'm just hitting the very beginning of Hosea. It goes worse. It gets worse. God goes, okay, I want you to do it again. Really? Like, what else could they figure out from this? But it's interesting, get to the end of verse 13, and this is, I don't know about the rest of you guys, I, I, I mean, I try to be loving, forgiving, whatever else it is, but if this, you know, if chapter one and the beginning of two had happened to me, um, this is a little bit what it looks like for me. I, I mean, my, you know, my response would be, the ver there's two words that start, the, the, the verse 14 starts out like this with the word therefore. And so this is my verse 14 of Hosea. And uh, it would be like this. Therefore, because you are a lion cheating no good, do me wrong or I'm blocking you on Facebook and cutting your dysfunctional bad self out of my life, you're dead to me. <laughs> Line from my father-in-law. You're dead to me. I mean, that's my response. Have you ever noticed that the things that annoy you the most about the people that are around you are usually your areas of weakness or inconsistency? Why is that? Have you ever noticed that the expectation that you place on God is often based on how you would respond to a situation like that? What if I told you that that was because in our own minds, we often create God in our own image. Yes. And so we attach our expectation then is how I would respond in that situation. So it's difficult for me to believe that I could be faithful in a situation like that because that God could be faithful because I, I just read how faithful I think I'd be. And yet, 
The only part about the response to that situation that lines up between what God would do, his response and my response is actually the word therefore. And I love how he goes off in here. All of this stuff, chapter one, chapter two, one through 13, all these horrible ways. And suddenly, God speaks. And he says, therefore, because of all of that stuff, that's what therefore means. Because of all that. If you say therefore, it means that everything that was before that is driving what's coming next. He says, therefore, behold. Now, the word behold in this context is a lot more like what we would do. Watch this. I mean, there's, there is all of the excitement of God tied up in this. He's like, you, you know, hold my beer, watch this, <laughs> you know? And God's like, therefore, watch this. And his response is breathtaking. He says, therefore, behold, I will allure her, which is the same, can be translated, I will woo her. My wife has um, been such a picture to me of somebody wooed by God. I watched one of the best things about being married to her is to watch her be wooed by Jesus. Anybody who knows my wife knows that <laughs> at the drop of a hat, she's praying, prophesying, whatever it is, because she's just actually listening for the voice of God at every moment. That puts me to shame. Not really. But it's, it's astounding. There is this thing where there's this thing. He says, therefore, watch this. I'm going to allure her. What? Did he say allure? Did he say woo? This is the, this is the unfaithful one that left him with two kids with terrible names. He's busy trying to profit. How do you be a prophet? I'm trying to be a single dad prophet. The whole thing... Therefore, watch this, I will allure her, says in verse 14. He says, I will bring her into the wilderness. What? Here's the collision between the romance of God and wilderness. <clears throat> Here's where they come together, and you see this crazy thing. What, <laughs> you know, by the way, we're going to the vacant lot. You know, I mean, that's how we look at wilderness. You know, if you think about how you think about wilderness, most of us, that's how we're, we read that sentence. We're like, therefore, I will allure her. I'm going to take her to the wilderness and I'm going to speak kindly to her. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All characteristics of the person and nature of God. And by the way, he takes all of them everywhere he goes. You ever find yourself on Facebook, Instagram, any other platform that you have, and you have a moment where you think, I need to unhinge my kindness or my gentleness or my self-control in order to make a point? Jesus did not join you in that. You are all by yourself. I mean, he's there. <laughs> That's not, you're not flying under his power at that moment, right? It's so interesting. I will speak kindly to her. I will take her into the wilderness. Now, wilderness from God's perspective is an entirely different thing. Look at what God says here in verse 15. He says, then I will give her vineyards, give her her vineyards from there. Where are they? They're in the wilderness. He's allured her. He's wooed her away into the wilderness. Wilderness, by the way, by definition means untouched by man. It's uncivilized because it is untouched by man. We're going to get into this just a little bit as we, as we land this plane here in just a minute. But it's untouched by man in the wilderness. And that's an important thing for God. And it has, it's inextricably tied. That means you can't pull it apart. It is tied to romance, to his romantic pursuit of you, not just somebody 
thousands of years ago. This romance is alive today for us grizzled old guys, for young guys, for beautiful women, for, for, for oh, there's only beautiful women. What was I, where was I going with that? Yeah, I know, right? Right, Whew. that was so close. So close. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is good and your mercy endures forever. All right. Right? So, so here's this thing. This pursuit has been going on since the moment of creation. When you were the object, humanity was the object of the affection of God. And Jesus in the incarnation takes on humanity, takes on flesh, and he brings it forever into the midst of the Trinity, and it's wrapped up now in the perichoresis, the dance between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that love is flowing, and that romance has been alive and well since that time. God in pursuit of man, in pursuit of you. That whole time. And to this day, and tomorrow, and all the days that follow. Because that's what he's doing. And he says, I will give her her vineyards from there. So he's going to sustain her, right? By the way, vineyards represent not only sustaining, but parties. Yes. Those of us that like partying, don't take that the wrong way. And the Valley of Achor is a door of hope, okay? This is a place of barrenness. And yet it says that hope is going to be there. That's the place where hope comes from. It comes in the wilderness. So we have provision. We have celebration. We have hope. And says so she will sing there in the days of her youth. How many of you know that children inherently hear and see God? And we train it out of them, generally. Religion trains it out of them. Needing behavior inside of structure trains it out of children. I'm not going to get too side, <laughs> side pulled off into this, but there's powerful things birthed in kids. Their faith is powerful. When they say they see an angel, have them describe it to you. Don't go... Well, you know, baby, don't talk them out of it. They saw one. When they say they saw Jesus, hey, they saw him. Help them remember. Write it down. You want to give your kids a gift? Write down in a little notebook somewhere and say, on this day, you told me that you saw Jesus. And when they're a teenager and they're struggling with all the things that go along with being a teenager as they transition to being an adult, you whip out that little book and you say, you had an experience with Jesus Christ in the person on this day, this time. She will sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to turn there in the interest of time, but we're going to talk about it here as, as, as we kind of wrap this. That's in Exodus 14, 15, 16. We understand here that she refers to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Now, Egypt represents civilization. Egypt represents resource and source that comes from man. Touched by man, constructed by man, manipulated by man, provided by man, grown, built, managed by man. It's interesting that Egypt for the children of Israel represents at once both provision and safety and bondage at the same time. You ever notice that sometimes you're in the midst of bondage? 
And that's the biggest thing. It's shouting loudly. I'm a prisoner. I'm a slave. I'm in bondage. But yet you get free. And a part of you wants to go back to bondage because the devil, you know, you know is you're afraid there's a bigger devil that's out in freedom, right? Because that's a lie of the enemy. You were crafted for freedom. You were crafted for the wilderness. Immediately, if you look at those three chapters of Exodus, tail end of 13, 14, 15, 16, that ends up being this picture of the children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt that whole process. And it it says repeatedly in there about various wildernesses that they're up next to, they're going through, they're going to turn back from here, go over there. But it's all wrapped up in wilderness experience at this point. God is not taking them into the promised land yet. He's taking them to the wilderness. Ladies and gentlemen, the wilderness was not a passageway to the promised land. It was intentional. In the wilderness, character that is big enough to carry your dream is crafted. And if you get your dream and you don't get character, it will collapse under the weight. And my goodness, what a disappointment that is to have had your dream. I personally know what this is like. To have your dream and to have your own character torpedo the boat. No one took it from you, but you have this place where your own character torpedoes that boat. Children of Israel come out of there and they come into the wilderness because when they get into the promised land, they're going to need things that can only be developed in the wilderness, treasure that only comes in the wilderness. And we think of the wilderness as a place of scarcity, lack, and stripping. And the Lord, it's not that some things aren't scarce. It's not that some things aren't stripped. And it's not that you don't lack some things. It's just that you lack and there's scarcity and they're stripping of the wrong things. I guarantee you that if you're in the wilderness right now, there is abundance. And it doesn't just happen to be there. Remember when Jesus said to the disciples, he says, yeah, go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Because his heart, whoo, that was close. She's been waiting for that moment for whatever she said to me one time. I'm preaching with my feet half off this. Woo! My belly button just grabbed for air right there. <laughs> so here's Jesus going, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And I guarantee you, whatever your wilderness experience is, the Lord's crafted that place for intimacy. And yes, He's separating you from something but he's separating you to abundance and limit, limitless resource because it only is supposed to come from him. You cannot resource your dream. You cannot resource the dream that God's put in you for your life. You can't do it. You won't be able to do it. He designed it to be impossible for you to do. That was the whole message of the law in the Old Testament, by the way. Dang, we could preach three, four more hours on here. Right? <laughs> for the people in the front row. That was the whole purpose of the law, was to to expose the fact that there isn't a single thing that you can do to resource what God has for you. He is the only one that creates the destination and the resource to do it. You look at that 14, 15, 16, they come out out of Egypt. First challenge, he gives them water from a rock. 
He gives them manna from heaven. It shows up every day, but strangely enough, you can't store it up and use yesterday's manna. You have to get it back from him every day. He gives them meat, something they griped and moaned about having in Egypt, but he proved. Not only did he give them meat, he gave them so much meat that it rotted out in the yard because they couldn't eat enough of it. He provides direction and protection, vision at night, protection during the day. He shields them, he covers them, he loves them. He demonstrates his goodness over them. Sounds to me like this is not a very, it may be called wilderness and untouched by man, but it doesn't sound like a place of lack to me. Crazy, crazy. So, as we close here, I, you know, if, if we have prayer team people um, that want to come up and, and uh, begin to make their way up front, if you are in the midst of a wilderness season in your life, thank you, baby, for coming up. If you're in the midst of a wilderness season in your life and you are struggling to see treasure or the goodness of God in the midst of your wilderness experience. And, and you think, like the children of Israel said so many times, you think that you came here to die. Wasn't it possible that I could die in captivity? At least I had enough food. You got to bring me out here into the middle of the wilderness by myself and die out here. Sometimes it feels like that. The Lord wants to open a door of hope for you in the midst of the wilderness. He wants to resource you in the midst of the wilderness. He wants to set you free. He doesn't want you to have to go back to bondage in order to get dinner. Yeah, right? He's so out ahead of you preparing this place for you. So if you want a paradigm shift, so that your wilderness becomes your valley of blessing, of Baraka. Then I want you to come up. I want to pray for you. These guys want to pray for you, whatever. We just want to bless you. And let me pray over you real quick and we'll let you go. Jesus. Oh, that you would come and encamp around every life in this room, that this week would be pregnant with possibility. God, that there would be wind that blows. Lord, your Ruach, the breath of God, would come and fill their lungs, fill the lungs of them naturally and in the spirit. Every sickness, every disease healed, every place of captivity set free, chains broken, dead places brought to life. King Jesus, that you would teach us how to be both lovers and well-loved. We surrender. We surrender to being the object of your affection, that you would woo us into the wilderness place where we would learn what you look like, what you smell like what you sound like to the exclusion of all else. We look expectantly to your hand in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So when...